and that they'll, that they'll hand up and handle the wind as well. But we've got two solar arrays that are fully latched. When we got the Odyssey overflight, the first data that we had on battery state of charge was 101, 102% state of charge. Um, the touchdown state that we had before Odyssey went over the horizon is that the state of charge had dropped it to 91% against a predict of 90 percent at, at touchdown and then it was fully charged by the time we got back to talk to it again. So the spacecraft, it nailed it um, and uh, we couldn't be happier. And what we're going to do now is um, go through a few days of checking this thing out and um, turn it over to Peter and uh, Peter and all the instrument PIs can um, start doing their thing on the surface. Back to you, Veronica. Yeah, you'll have to understand it's been an exciting day, and uh, we'll get this right yet. Uh, there was one more major contributor, which uh, all of us forgot to mention, and it was the entire European Space Agency, which kindly offered the use of the uh, Mars Express spacecraft orbiter, and it was up there collecting the data, and luckily we didn't need a backup, but uh, it was nice to have it because Odyssey and MRO performed well. So thank you to, also to the European Space Agency and Mars Express. Okay, we're going to open it up to questions, and uh, as usual, just please wait for a microphone to come to you. And I'm looking for my microphones. We'll start up here in the front, and then we'll, we'll start working our way back. Okay, if we can bring a microphone up to the front, please. There we go. Hi, Craig Cavalt with Aviation Week. Congratulations. Uh, one science question and one uh, engineering question. Uh, science for Peter. Um, your favorite polygon there, the area looks a, a bit scoured by the descent um, engines, and it, I'm wondering if you, if you think maybe the ice, your surface hardness may indicate that uh, ice may be quite near the, the top since it looks like you blew away only about one inch and then you get uh, fairly hard, hard stuff. Uh, for Ed, was there any wind today at all that the system could detect? And, and secondly, why do you think the chute deploy was a little late? Well, you have a pretty good eye for seeing through the soil uh, down to the ice. Uh, <clears throat> those of us looking at the pictures up in the uh, um, operations center weren't able to make that determination. I think um, it's hard to say whether the, the streaks you see in that picture come from the thrusters. It, we have to see all the way down closer to the lander to make sure that they really, you know, originate at the lander. So I'm not ready to make the statements you made. Um, I think all I could say is that we're very excited to dig into this soil and find out where that ice layer is. And I'm very hopeful that as we get the pictures of our digging area, we'll see one of those polygon troughs as well as the interior of a polygon and we can do almost a, a cross-section across one of these things. Very important for polar research on the Earth, and I think probably the same for Mars. Okay, uh, regarding the parachute deployment, um, the parachute trigger, the primary trigger, um, works off of integrating the accelerometers in the IMU package. So when it integrates enough um, deceleration in the atmosphere, it tells the parachute it's, it's time to deploy. So that took about seven seconds later than we had planned, and there's a number of things that could account for that, either singularly or a combination of things. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to wait for the EDL team to start looking at the reconstruction without speculating. Um, there's a couple of things that, that could drive it, but um, I'd rather talk to the team first. Um, none that we've been able to detect. Not at the surface. Certainly when we looked at the weather uh, leading up to it, there was a lot of evidence of dust swirling, but uh, nothing at the surface. Okay, go ahead and back. Joe Palka from National Public Radio. Is there any indication, uh, going back to the ice uh, or the fact that you hope to see it, is there any concern seeing how little the surface was disturbed on landing that the robotic arm might have some trouble digging through this material? <laughs> and second of all, uh, is there is there any sense yet from the pictures that you've seen that you see anything like frost that uh, might indicate some outcrop of, of ice? Well, in the time that I personally have had to look at these images is probably a total of a few minutes. I would not say that I saw any frost. Uh, it, it may be very subtly found in some areas, but I, I haven't personally seen it. <clears throat> um, 
As far as the hardness of the soil, we have practiced in very, very hard soils, almost, you know, a form of concrete, not full hardness, but partial hardness of concrete. And uh, we can dig through those type of soils. That's the solid ice that we can't dig through that we expect to be underneath those soils. Uh, we actually did a, uh, a field test some years ago in Death Valley where we used that, uh, a similar arm to dig through the very hard soils that you couldn't have gotten a shovel into. And we just scraped away at it with our scrapers and we were able to get down, I think, 10 or 15 centimeters. So this arm has a lot of capability for digging through hard soil, but not solid ice. <clears throat> Henry Bortman with Astrobiology Magazine for Peter. Um, how close is this terrain to what you expected and, and what most surprises you about it from what you've seen so far? Yeah, it's surprisingly close to what we expected, and that's what surprises <laughs> me the most. <laughs> I expected a bigger surprise. We see very few rocks, just as we expected, and we see the polygons and the trough depths. While I haven't measured them, they certainly aren't very deep, and uh, just a few inches, I'm sure. And I, you could see them all the way out to the horizon, which is, verifies the fact that we don't need wheels on our lander. The one we're sitting on is just as good as the one we see on the horizon. Okay, we have a question in the middle here. Just wait for a microphone to come your way. Uh, this is Kelly Beattie from Sky and Telescope for Barry. What is the uh, approximate coordinates of your landing spot? How far from the center of the ellipse is it? And full disclosure on any bets that were won or lost. <laughs> <laughs> well, no comment on the bets. Um, I can give you the Latin launch. Uh, 234.3 is the estimated uh, is the estimated center of that 99% circle that you saw on the um, on the graphic we had a few moments ago, and the latitude is uh, 68.2 which is almost right on where we were predicting to land. Now, you asked how far from the center. I can't recall. I know the ellipse that you saw there was approximately 62 kilometers wide, so I'll guess that's about 25 to 28 kilometers. I see a nodding head by Gene, so, and so that's about right, about 25 to 28 kilometers. Anyone else want to answer the bets question? Oh no 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 no! I'm just glad that I'm just glad that uh, where is he? Oh uh, no, we had one uh, one person who bet on our infamous hill. Uh, where's Eric Bailey? He's not here. All right. Yeah, he's uh, he's one of the he's one of the uh, the guys hoisting one for all of us. Okay, we'll take another question then. Any more questions here? Oh, in the back. Bill, just wait for the microphone. Thanks, uh, Bill Harwood, CBS. For any of you, really, I was I was curious if you expect to be able to see the back shell, the heat shield, and/or the parachute, not from MRO but from Phoenix, 